Hello. Today we'll be visiting my friend Chris Squires again uh, to see his new 4K film scanner and also pick up some new equipment along the way. And I'll be taking my helper Scotty here. Now, uh, which car should we take, Scotty? This one because 1994 Toyota Celica is the best car in the world. OK, we won't take that one then. Right, let's get no. started. Hello, we've arrived at our destination. Right, so what we have is we're bringing some equipment to Chris, which is a couple of um, high eight decks, and we have collected from uh, Swin uh, from Bristol a digi beater and a rather nice monitor, and we'll have a play with that later. But uh, right now, let's go to Chris's and um, have a look at his uh, new film scanner. So what we have here. Um, Panasonic NV uh, FS200, which is similar to the FS88, which was one of my first machines, only this one has a TPC. Uh, apparently does not work terribly well. NV, um, NV or AG4700, uh, very similar to the NV HS1000, favourite machine of mine, uh, also non-working, and an EVC2000, and I brought one of these up actually, which is apparently in good working order. This one is not, so that's something else to play with later. We have um, a couple of computers. These have been used for video capture in the past. So that includes um, a Blackmagic capture card and the breakout cable for it. So that could be interesting. Uh, a spare graphics card. Oops, dropped it. And a couple of monitors. So there's an HP monitor here. Uh, this is in good working order. So that's a sort of professional grade thing. And uh, somewhat lighter, uh, what's this one, LG. So they'll come in handy. Right, so we need to load those into the car and then we can have a look uh, at this new uh, 4K film scanner. Okay, so this is the Scanbox 4K. Uh, in case you hadn't uh, seen Chris in the last video. Chris, say hello. Hello, Colin. So, um, talk me through what's going on here. Which is the supply spool for start? Right, this is where it all starts. And as this machine is a 4K, there's the camera, the key bit. Uh, it's all controlled by these little levers here and on the computer behind you, which we'll cover in a second. The film obviously comes out there, and as you say, there's so many rollers, but that's all just to keep these tension so the film is perfectly flat and straight. These are what are called PTR rollers. So although the film I already clean, I've already cleaned it using film guard, these are just in case there's any spare bits of dust or fluff that settle at some point. So they'll take that off before travelling around the tension arm. That's the head there to make sure that you've got the right uh, 8mm, super 8mm, 16mm or 9.5mm. That houses a little laser which fires a laser at the sprockets so it knows exactly what frame and where the frame should be. Very clever. In front of the camera, the capstan there, so there's actually no, there's no gearing on this at all. There's no claw. Oh. So if um, film is damaged or... Um, so if the sprockets are, are ripped off, are ripped off, it'll still go anyway. It doesn't matter because none of this uses any kind of claw. That's a little rubber capstan, which keeps the film feeding around to another tension wire yeah, here. To, to the second tension arm down here and finally on to its, its final resting place. What else to tell you? It can deal with 16mm optical sound, that's that little button there, and this little box here, you can't see it very well, that fires a light at 16 millimeter optical film so that it registers a sound for each, it's like um, an oscilloscope. Right, yeah. So it's 16 millimeter sound, 16 millimeter magnetic, and 8 millimeter magnetic. So three different types of sound. So, uh, as it stands, what film sizes does it support? Funnily enough, that shows you on this little wheel heel. This is the tension setter. So, it, at the moment, it's set for 8 millimeter. Eight. S8, which is standard 8, which was launched in the UK in 1968. And then if I push that arm in and twist it, that will be set for 16mm and 9.5mm, which are both much larger sizes of film. 
So it varies the tension depending on what you tell it what type of film is loaded. And these arms mm -hmm. uh, will vary so that it gets a nice smooth passage through the system. Can I ask that question on its head then? What film types does it not support, either at all or as it stands now? There are three major types of film that it won't support. That is obviously 70, which is <laughs> the, the big stuff. I mean, that's yeah. IMAX kind of level. 35 mil, which up until you know a decade ago was the standard cinema, cinematographer's uh, large scale film. And there's a very rare um, set of film called 17 and a half millimeter film which in 20 odd years of doing this and 12 years of doing it with this type of machinery I've, no, I've never been asked right. to do. Um, so <laughs> really it's only the big boys, mm. the 35 mil and the 70 mil which are real Warner Brothers type yeah. stuff yeah. that it doesn't handle. This is what you'd call small format, even 16 right. millimeter is still mm. classed as small format photography. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever looked inside this as it's being installed. Have you any idea what's going on in the back? Because it's a very big piece of kit. I did in the last one. I, I was brave enough to take the back cover off what was called the Memory HD. And if you ever wondered why it was so heavy, it's because it's all based on a great big slab of concrete, which is there to stabilise everything. Mm -hmm. the, the key thing with Cinefilm is movement. You know, you want it to be moving where you want it to be moving with no wobble or shake. Um, so they were, they were very heavy machines, mainly mm. because all the components, everything was weighted down. I haven't been brave enough to take the back off this yet. I've only had it up and running about a week and a half at the moment. So I'm still in the experimental mm. phases. I'm not outputting any customer's work at the moment until I'm absolutely certain I've got everything bang on. Can you show us a little bit about the camera head? Can we go into any more detail there, or yeah, is it um, all sealed as it stands? It, 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 the last one was completely sealed. This one isn't. The, the camera is of incredibly expensive. The camera was about half the cost of the actual machine. Mm -hmm. Just that little one bit, because it's so um, sophisticated. So that's... That's that little that the bit lens there, there is, right, yeah. which is pointing, and, and the output of this is what we'll come on to now, and we'll show you know what the computer control can do, so that the image shot from this 4K camera will actually give us. But it does. I think it's an important thing to say here. This is nothing like shooting a camera at a screen with something being projected on it. Well, There's an exact synchronization, isn't there, between each frame and the scanning process on that Absolutely, camera. and that's what this little box is for. So it controls, it, it houses a laser control which fires at the sprocket holes so that it knows exactly when the frame is bang on the centre. Right. And that's when the camera is synchronised perfectly to the actual film going past right. it. I started shooting film about 20 years ago with exactly that, thinking, Oh, if I get a really good camera and point it at this screen, surely that'll work. Mm -hmm. no. no. And sadly, companies, some companies, still do pretty much that with mirrors and screens. I've, and seen I've even seen one camera, one company, I've even seen one company saying they are, are 4K, but all they've done is bought a 4K camera. Yes. It's not the real deal at It's all. not the real deal. So what speed is this? Because there's no reason this has to run at the proper frame rate is though, it could run at any frame rate couldn't it? it within it, its capabilities. Within its capabilities, you are limited by what PAL um, would want. PAL works at 25 frames per second so I wouldn't want to capture it more than that because I want one frame of video to equal one frame of cinefilm. It can run fast, it can run up to 50 frames per second but it's set at 24 frames per second at the moment, that's what I like working on because I have to make changes and I have to keep an eye on the film and I don't want it running too fast. I could yeah. run it twice as fast but I've never, never used the old 50 frames per second capture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which the last one was capable of because I like to keep control of what I'm seeing yes. and what's happening and I think running it at 50 frames per second which don't forget for the old film was probably three times its proper speed if it was 16 frames per second mm -hmm. you'll lose control. Yeah. 
Uh, how do you, uh, one silly question, I mean I see that there's a lens, this is an open lens here, yeah. so how do you keep that dust free? Um, the best way of doing that is with um, air. Um, I have my little air canisters up there, but don't forget that the focal length on that is so tight between that and the film, it would, even if there was dust on the lens it would not be picked up because it's almost focusing through it. Yes. But a quick blast of air first thing every morning. This room is, is pretty much sealed, it's not a very dusty room at all. Any dust that comes, oh, the film is cleaned first obviously, but any dust that comes from the film is picked off by these PTR rollers before it even gets there. There is obviously a theory that, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a vacuum controlled, mm. dust free room where we're all working in white suits. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it would make that much difference, but it might push the costs up a little. Yes. How do you clean these rollers? Um, once a month, unscrew them. Warm water. Right. <laughs> Simple it, as that, yeah. It's, it's a super sticky substance. It's one of those things that it just works, and I couldn't tell you exactly why. But once a month, apparently I haven't got to that point yet, unscrew them, take them off, wash them. It does remind me of my old skateboard wheels, funnily enough. Mm. Pop that back on, and it picks off all the dust and lint. Oh, what are these parts here? Are these for different film sizes? Yes. I'll pick Can off you, one yeah. and show you. This is for 16 millimeter. So, so this is the 16 millimeter head, which you, I'll sh turn it around and show you. But that's where that fits. See that central knob yeah. matches mm -hmm. that. It's wider than the 8 millimeter ones because because that's where the 16 millimeter film will be tracking along. That's where the camera is permanently pointed at. So that's where the film passes and the shot is taken. And what we have here. Is the rather wonderful little sound head, not film head, that's the film head, the sound head, which is for magnetic film, that's for optical film for 16, that one there I told you about earlier, mm -hmm. this is for magnetic film, so to place the head in place, just click nice. that, and any sound that's on the film will be picked up. Okay, I have a burning question now, hmm. that's the aperture through which the uh, lens is viewing, the camera is viewing the film, mm. and that's 16 millimeters mm. film. So when you are running, say, an 8 millimeter film, how do you set the camera up mm. so that the, the camera uh, CCD, mm. presumably something like a CCD, mm. is fully occupied with uh, image? So you're not wasting any you're of the camera's capability? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good question. This is a similar setup. This is the rig for 8 millimeter. And as you can see, not only are the runners narrower to accommodate the 8mm film, the aperture is much narrower mm -hmm. as well. So what you're doing with the camera is that isn't a fixed camera fixed on a hole. That camera moves backwards and forwards uh -huh. with these settings here. So I'm changing the focal length of the camera by moving it closer or further. And I'm changing the focus of the camera as well. So the camera will be further away so that the sensor picks up all of yeah. the 16 millimeter Whatever film image. size it is. I mean, you must then have I some wastage around the edge, but within... Within generally. reason, yeah. and then it goes in much closer to film um, 8 millimeter film. And don't forget, with 8 millimeter film, the image is only 5.5 oh. millimeters. Mm -hmm. So that's why that isn't 8 millimeters. It's much less than that. And so the camera gets much closer. So right. There's right. no wasted capacity on the camera. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Chris, uh, let's have a look at this machine working, because last time you used a computer similar to this, I think, to drive the machine. Yes. So, uh, can you do that again? Of course. The, the main difference between this better machine and my last one is that this one can also be controlled from the machine. You saw its control panel, and everything That's you can do on here, here. Right. Yep. you can do on there. So you've got play, pause, stop, changing all the colours, changing all the focus, etc. But the main work is done on these two screens here. This is where all the magic happens. As you would expect with small format film, the vast majority of the film I've seen in the last 18 years has been amateur. Home shot, mum and dad, granddad in 1950s, 60s or 70s, where there was no feedback on the cameras whatsoever. You didn't find out whether you'd shot a good or a bad film until two weeks later, when you sent your packet off to Kodak and the, 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 the processed film returned and you wound it up, stick it on the projector, then you'd know whether you've got a really good film or a piece of rubbish. So it's very hit and miss. So the majority of film looks like this. It's all wrong with the colours. It's all very red, very dark in the corners. So what I want to try and do 
with every piece of film is try and bring it as close to perfect as possible. And this is where all of that happens. You've got three screens. The big one here and the right hand one there is what's being captured. That's what the customer will finally see. And this is the whole thing raw. So that's the one I want to concentrate on after looking at that, trying to get that as close to possible, close as possible to perfect. And this machine has so much control. You can see here three little bar graphs for red, green and blue. And if you look at that picture, you can tell me what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. It's far too red. And you can see that visualised there with too much red. So the first thing I want to do is check the white balance just once. And suddenly that red bar has shot down as it's getting closer to perfect. It's still too high and the green's too low. So my job is to try and equalise all of those three bars at around there, which is about as good a perfect shot as you're going to get. So Within, of course, I suppose, an eye for what the original material was. Oh, absolutely. Um, film shot in India at dusk with a super red sky. I don't want to make blue, green and red. Right. I want to leave it uh, rather, better, rather like the skyline and that picture behind the machine up there. So I've always got to take into account, is it indoors, is it outdoors, is it inside a church? How many weddings from the 70s and 80s would have had a single camera and no lighting would have been allowed mm. in those days if you were allowed to get the camera in there. So what I'm trying to do is, bearing in mind what the scene actually is, get it as close to perfect as possible to what the cameraman would have meant at the time. Yes. It's very subjective, of course. It's still me you having to know. interpret. Um, and it's not like a feature film. The, the joy of an amateur film is... It, it is what it is. With a feature film, you'll shoot it three or four times with the camera pre-rolling and superb mm. lighting. Mm. This is just on the fly. So I've brought the red down. It's closer to the green and blue. It's still rather dark. So I'll change the whole image. Brightens up there. Green's still too low. This bit here, in the centre here, gives me control of each of the individual colours. So, take up all. I can boost the red. Oh, it's suddenly gone very red. Take the red right down too low, but I want it to be about there. But now the green and the blue have to come and join it. And we're about there. Much better. I've also got the game controls for the individual colours as well. You know, and that will blast the red out of the sky if I want that. So I could, I've got control of the game and of the individual lights as well. Focus, of course the key component of any film is focus. Right where you are there, I've got my little focus button. So what I do, is I press on the focus and I have a little number. Can you see a little number yeah. there? 173. As I move out, or in a focus, it's dropped down to 163, which means I'm moving out of focus. It's all shot by lasers. So I'm now putting it back into focus. 74, 72, so I've gone past. 73, if that goes down to 72, I know 773. It's a different number every time. But it's just where the peak is. 173 is going to be about it. There we are. So that, I think, is looking for how much high-frequency content there is in the image. Absolutely. It's, it's to get the focus sharper than my eyes. Um, yeah, so why can't it do that automatically? Um, the more sophisticated, I think, the higher-end machines particularly can, but it's also subjective. Don't forget, you know, again, it, it's still up to a human to decide. We can make the whole thing mechanical if we wanted to, but it's still not as good as having a human in the middle of it. Um, so manually from there, the last one controlled the camera from in, within there so I could zoom it in and out from in there. But I quite like the, the manual touch, you get the feel of watching the numbers move as you're moving in and out of focus. So you've got the focus set. Another thing that's quite important is what's called gamma. Yes. You know, shadows and highlights. Mm -hmm. I always um, say to my customers, imagine filming a wedding, which is basically a woman in a white dress. 
in a graveyard. You know, with something that can easily have blown out whites versus overly dark leaves of trees in the background. So I'm trying to get the perfect balance. So the brightness isn't too bright. If I move the gamma too high, see how the image is getting too dark. And that's too bright, too blinding. And it's not this. It's not the same as just exposure, which is just bright and dark. It's actually moving. It's the gain curve. The gain curve. So about 80 is where I like it. About there. So I can change just the straight exposure as well. Yes. So the control, the control this machine gives me from the computer and from there, but from the computer is where I'm going to be using it from, is immense. Two different types of processing, RGB. So again, you can change the blues. And you've also got these wonderful things, which I'm sure you recognize. HSL curves, hue, saturation, and luminescence. So I can change the key components. If anyone's ever played with Photoshop, you know mm. what goes to make an image. All the things that, that can change. If you want to. <laughs> yeah. So if I was to uh, buy one of these machines for my business off their website now, this manufacturer's website, I believe they're French, aren't they? They are. Uh, what sort of money would that system cost me now? Well, things are always changing. The memory HD, which was a only HD capable, um, I bought in 2009, which was £100,000. Um, so this is a far superior model. But because things have moved on now, you're looking at about between sixty and seventy thousand right. pounds. Get a lot so more bang for your buck then, eh? You do, you do. Yeah. Things have moved on in the last ten last ten years, so you're getting a lot more for your money, but it's still a substantial investment. Right, um, yeah. because I could do it a lot cheaper, but you know what it's like. Cheaper always costs you more in yeah. the long run. Get the best you can afford, get the best there is. And I think the Scanbox 4K is just about that in the market at the moment. Mm -hmm. We have a, one of the machines we're going to test here. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to um, try these out before I came. We so need to rewind. We'll definitely need to rewind. Should we need high speed rewind? Would that be fun? Great thing about this model, the EVC 2000, like the EVS 9000, has got a turbo rewind function, which it Rewinds unlaced, which is pretty much unique on 8mm decks because uh, most 8mm decks are laced during rewind. So it's a turbo rewind, but you don't get a tape counter because it doesn't have any heads next to the tape. But it certainly sounds like it's rewinding beautifully, doesn't it? I'm fascinated by the serial uh, I, can't, I can't really see the machine at the moment. Right? Okay, now I can see it. So that's in turbo rewind. Yeah. Because it's got the same deck as the EVS 9000, which is the legend of all 8 mm decks. Shall we just stop and see what we get? We may need to edit a little bit of it. A little bit of junk at the extreme bottom. Mm. That's in the head switching area anyway. I think we'd call that a working video call, wouldn't we? Lovely. That's not much, is it? Fetch your search. Yeah, not that fast for the picture search. It seemed a little bit not well centred. Mind you, we don't know if it's recording me. It could be the tape yeah. rather than the player. This is uh, EVS 1000. Very rare machine, this one. Uh, a beautiful machine. Let's uh, give it a whirl. Um. Oh. Is the tape moving? I don't believe so. Ah, something's broken. It's. We could use a remote controller then. Um, line out. <laughs> no, it's just. I am on line out. No, it's ignoring all. Do you have a remote control for 
Sony high energy. That would do. Uh, may it be set to the correct number. So it's battery. So Please say yes. These have multiple command modes, yes. and I'm not sure which one this one's set to. So we'll just try them all. Okay. Have a dead machine. Should we eject? It would be great if it worked. It certainly worked last time I tried it. I've, got, try about, I've got about four or five more remotes well, upstairs. I'll, I'll try my original tape. If this doesn't work, I'll stop recording. Ah, do you know what might have happened? We might have missed the dew sensor. Because uh, that's exactly what it would do in dew. Yeah. Hmm. Excuse the pun. You're not funny. So, it's a dew, well, there will be a dew sensor, but it's a fairly dim display, so I can't necessarily see it. There we are. Also a gorgeous machine. <laughs> I thank you for leaving both of them with me. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm very grateful. It's lovely. That's that's good, isn't it? It's good. That's this head switching noise at the bottom, which of course when you trim that off. Yeah, it's a nice machine. But this does not have the turbo rewind. Mm. Yeah, that's a lovely machine. And a very rare one. And this, the feature this does have is PCM Digital Audio. Yes. <laughs> Good man, Colin. Yeah. So, yes indeed, I did leave both of those machines with Chris. The EVS-1000E, which is a particularly rare machine, I think because they have a tendency to break down, so there's not many good working ones left and the EVC-2000E, which is a kind of slimmed down version of the EVS-9000E, which was the top of the range i8 deck. Now, other things I picked up on that trip was the things I got from Chris, which was some computers and some video recorders, but also on the way uh, I called in at Bristol and collected a studio grade monitor, which I'll certainly be playing with and have a look at that on YouTube, and the DigiBeta recorder. And we even have the service manual for it. So I'm really looking forward to having a look at that. Uh, that will be my next YouTube video very shortly. Please remember to like, share and especially subscribe. And I'll do a lot more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.